Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. We're continuing on in a study that we started last week called A Clear and Present Danger. Uh, This is about an ecumenical movement that's more than ecumenical. It's about all faiths joining together uh, and the danger of that. So if you've not seen the first part of this study, I really recommend that you take time to watch that prior to watching this. And please remember that the Word of God says, love rejoices with the truth. 1 Corinthians 13, 6. This teaching came about as a result of a document entitled On Human Fraternity for World Peace and Living Together. It was created in February of of this year, 2019, by Roman Catholic Pope Francis and the Islamic Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, Ahmed Al-Tayyib. Now, we looked at that carefully in the first part of this study. We're certainly going to touch on it in this. I I need you to understand that this study is not a tirade against Roman Catholics nor against Muslims, although it should certainly challenge and stand against any of the false beliefs, teachings, or practices of either of those religious organizations. The motivation for this message is to show scripturally the gross error of that document proclaiming the brotherhood and fellowship of, and this is a quote, all persons who have faith in God and faith in human fraternity to unite and work together to advance a cultural, a a mutual respect and the awareness of the great divine grace that makes all human beings brothers and sisters. Apparently, in spite of whatever they choose, okay? And that was, as I say, we covered that last week. Uh, We are not brothers and sisters. We have a father. When you were born again, and you had to be born again, is what Jesus said, you must be born again. You were born of your father, who is the father of spirits. You have a father in heaven. Jesus said to the Pharisees who rejected his word, he said, you are of your father, the devil. We're not brothers with everybody by any means. And that's very, very important. Don't let anybody deceive you. That's not what God wants, is us to have unity with unbelievers. I mean, we talked about that. Paul says, what is a believer in common with an unbeliever? What has light to do with darkness? So keep that in mind. The primary issue here, dealt with at length in the first part of the study, is the simple fact that we are not all brothers and sisters. If you know and believe the Word of God, that should be abundantly clear. The problem, of course, is that most people who call themselves Christian even Bible-believing, do not actually know the Scriptures very well, and all too often often don't actually believe them as shown by their lives. So that's the purpose of this study. And Father, I just pray, Lord God, Lord, that you would watch every and control every word that comes out of my mouth, that it originate from what you've put in my heart. And Lord, that it be a blessing, Lord. It's not meant to be a curse to anybody, but a blessing to all. Lord, that we would choose to follow you in spirit and in truth, to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Lord, teach us. Teach us. Lead us in paths of righteousness as you have promised. Thank you, Lord God. Now, the Lord spoke to the prophet Hosea so many years ago and said, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Hosea 4, 6. God's people perish for a lack of knowledge. So it's important that we, that we know, that we understand, that we're willing to take the time to study these things. So I pray that this message today will prayerfully be considered, tested by the word, and then received. Over the last four decades of my life, I've shared the gospel Uh, and the good news, and the love of God with many Jews, Muslims, Hindus, and Catholics, and also prayed for them, but not necessarily with them, unless they were praying to repent and receive the Lord into their hearts. The Lord does not hear every prayer. It says in 1 John chapter 5 that this is the confidence that we have, that if we pray anything according to his will, He does hear us. And if he hears us, well, you know what? He'll he'll take care of it. (laughs) 
And it is his will that people accept the atoning work of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross and be saved. Right? That's what he said through Peter. He desires that none should perish, but all come to salvation. So that's the foundation that we're working with here today. And I just wanted to share this with you, just give you a, a little background. I said that I've shared the gospel with a lot of people. Uh, not, well, a few years back, we were over in Oldham, England. And while a group of Christians had gotten a permit to stand in town center and pass out tracts or sing songs, uh, I went that day and I wandered around and I just, led by the Spirit, just started to share the gospel with people. And I walked up to two fellows who were sitting on a, a bench in the middle of town center. And I said that to them. I said to them, you know, do you know that Jesus Christ loves you? And one of the fellows looked at me and he said, we're Muslim. And I said, what difference does that make? You realize that Christ came to take away the sins of the world. For God so loved the world. We are to love all people, not have unity with them. And be at peace with all people as much as it's in our power. We're not to have unity, but we are to have love. Okay. Do you, you have to be in agreement with people that you're going to fellowship with. You know, it says in Amos 3.3, 3, the two men walk together unless they're agreed. You can't have unity with somebody unless you're in agreement with them. We're called to love them, to be at peace, but not to have unity with them. The Lord Jesus, he always spoke out against the teaching and practice of the Pharisees, the leaders, the hierarchy of his people when they were contrary to the teaching of the word. And he commanded, do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. For you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Matthew 23, 9 through 13. The truth is to be found, according to scriptures, only in one way. I mean, this is what Jesus said. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. John 8, 31 and 30 to 32. And of course, it is the scriptures that testify of Jesus. That's what it says in John 5, 39. That's what he said in John 5, 39. Jesus is the only way. When, the, when the, the, the Apostle Thomas questioned Jesus, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. John 14, 6. That's a troubling verse for anybody who's looking for this ecumenical movement. You can't come to God. You can't have a right relationship with the Father unless you go through the atoning, through Jesus Christ, through his shed blood, the atoning work on the cross, the word of the cross. To be a part, being part of a church doesn't make you part of the family of God. Doesn't make you a child of God. But being a child of God makes you part of the church. Don't get that backwards. You see, and as I mentioned last week, I was raised a Catholic. So, you know, I was born into a Catholic household. I was baptized as an infant. I had no idea what was going on or anything. But that doesn't make you part of the church. Accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's what makes you part of the church. When you, when you are saved, you become part of the church. When you become, you know, just because you become part of a church doesn't mean that you're saved. This is very important. Isaiah spoke. Isaiah 8, uh, chapter, chapter 8, verse 20 said, To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn, no light. So it's got to be according to the word. Our lives have to be... God has made a promise to lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. How does, he, how does he do that? 
Well, his word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It's with his word that he leads us. To Timothy, the apostle Paul wrote, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ. 2 Timothy 3.15. Salvation comes, Peter says, you know, it's the, the imperishable seed of the word is what brings us to that saving moment. And it says in the Psalms, you know, how sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. From your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, 103 to 105. We, we, we've got to hate the false way. Not the people that practice it. We need, to, we need to bring them the love of God that has the power. We need to bring them the word of God, which has the power to correct. So the issue here is a call for spiritual unity for all mankind by the Pope and the Imam, which is not called for by God. This is not a new concept for the Catholic Church, by the way, although it's recent to our times. I mean, the Catholic Church never believed that anybody outside the Catholic Church had any potential to be saved or have a right relationship with God until the Second Vatican Council, which took place in the early 1960s, there was a document that came forth from that, from that Vatican Council called Nostra Aetate, Our Times, which was a declaration on the relation of the church to non-Christian religions. Now, they were saying for the first time that you can have a relationship with non-Catholics, non basically. And they demonstrated that in practice in the Italian city of Assisi. That was the birthplace of Francis of Assisi. Now, when Pope John Paul II called for and hosted a prayer meeting with 160 leaders from 32 Christian denominations and 11, 11 other non-Christian religions, that was the first of what is now an ongoing tradition that has been continued by both Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. Now, as a little bit of an aside, but I think this is important, Pope Francis was born Jorge Mario Bergoglio in Argentina, and he was ordained as a Catholic priest in 1969, but he was trained as a Jesuit That's, uh, and became the provincial superior of the Jesuits in that country. That's important if you know the history of the Jesuits and the Catholic Church. There were a lot of issues that took place there. So Francis became Pope and the first Jesuit Pope in the history of the Catholic Church in March of 2013, after Pope Benedict uh, the 16th resigned, which was in itself, I mean, amazingly unusual. I mean, this whole thing is very, very unusual, very out of the ordinary, even for the Catholic Church. When he was elected Pope, when he chose the name Francis, and he said that was supposedly to honor Francis of Assisi, for his commitment to the poor. Now, that's the first time in 900 years that a pope chose a name that had not been used by a predecessor. But what's really worthy of note, and all pertinent to this study, is the fact that Assisi was at the time the home of Catholicism's interfaith prayer meetings that were started by John Paul II in 1986. Now, the Franciscans, which is an order of priests within the Catholic Church, the OFM, they said that Francis of Assisi has become an emblem of the possibility of overcoming barriers between people, cultures, and religion. Overcoming the barriers. There are barriers between different religions. Uh, not believing in Jesus Christ is quite the barrier to becoming a Christian, I'll tell you that. So I, I, I want to restate something that I've said a number of, in a number of other studies, uh, last one and many others. A book that I'm writing called The Schemes of the Devil and the Triumph of Christ Jesus. That the schemes, the wiles of the devil, the primary one, the first one is division. Because you know, a house divided cannot stand, Jesus said. He wants to bring division among brothers. 
One of the ways he can do that is by bringing unity between non-believers. You know, the, the path we walk is straight and narrow. How narrow is it? It's like a tightrope. And Satan doesn't care if you go off this direction or off that direction as long as you go off. When it comes to unity and it comes to this and, and placating other religions and non-believers, what comes to my mind is Elijah on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18. I, I, I pray that you know that account, right? Because Elijah went there and it says he came near to all the people and said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. You've got to choose what gods. And I promise you, the Hindus don't have the same gods that we have. The same God. The highest command. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Muslims don't have. Allah is not the same as Yahweh, God the Father. Okay? It's not. So how can you have that unity? You've got to choose. It's not, not what... Joshua said as, as God was leading him to lead the people out of uh, the wilderness and into the promised land, said, you have to choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Jesus said, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And again from now, this is from the document that Francis and, this, uh, and the imam wrote, which was called, by the way, Human Fraternity for World Peace and Living Together. And in that document, they say, the first and most important aim of religions is to believe in God, to honor him, and to invite all men and women to believe that this universe depends on a God who governs it. He is the creator who has formed us with his divine wisdom and has granted us the gift of life to protect it. The universe does not depend on a God. The universe depends on the God, the God who created it. And James wrote and said, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder, James 2.19. A lot of people believe in God. That's not the same thing as accepting the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross and believing in the one true God. It's written of our father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten sin, son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. John 3, 16 and 17. That is the most important name of God. That's the important name of God. And that's the gift of God. Jesus is the gift of God who desires that none should perish. That's what I've quoted a minute ago. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. There is no greater gift. There is no greater love. Neither the Father nor Jesus, who came to take away the sins of the world, desires that any person, including those who are now part of the Roman Catholic Church, or a Sunni or a Shiite Muslim, nor a Buddhist, a Hindu, a follower of Confucius, or any other group that does not proclaim the atoning work of Jesus on the cross should perish, nor do I. So the purpose of this study is that people would hear the truth and accept that amazing gift of life that Francis Nimob said was granted to us, but in truth, God only offered it to us. The only way to receive it is to believe in Jesus and accept it, and that on his terms. There is salvation in no one else. This is Acts 4.12. Listen to this now. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. 
Confucius can't save you. Buddha can't save you. Muhammad can't save you. The only one who can, not, not any of the saints, they can't save, the, the Catholic Church has made so many of. The only one that can save you is the name of Jesus Christ. And that is about the word of the cross. And you know, Paul says to the church in Corinth, the word of the cross is the power of God unto salvation. Okay, it's evil. I want you to know that it's evil to say or acknowledge by acceptance that there are many ways to salvation or many gods. It's as evil to do that as to say that there is no God. And Jeremiah said so many years ago, this is Jeremiah eleven thirteen. for your gods are as many as your cities. He's speaking to a disobedient people, the people of God. He says, your gods are as many as your cities, O Judah, and as many as the streets of Jerusalem are the altars you have set up to the shameful thing, altars to burn, incense to Baal. It's, listen, it's possible to be called part of the people of God and to be worshiping false gods. And I promise you, that's not going to work. Because as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. There's no alternative, there's no other way. And it's not a matter of religion. Religion is about the works you do. This is about the free gift of God. This is about the gift of God that comes by faith, hearing the word of God. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That you would believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Satan, the adversary, the one who would make himself like the Most High God, as it says in Isaiah 14, 14, he has always been the great counterfeiter. The one Paul spoke of when he said, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15. You know, God searches the heart. I can't search your heart, but I can hear the words that come from your mouth. I can see the works that you do. And the works that you do are evidence of what you believe in your heart. They don't, rep they don't take the place of what <laughs> you believe in your heart. We've been warned. I mean, Jesus warned us, Paul warned us, but Jesus warned us particularly. And, and when he was asked by his apostles, you know, what will we tell us? What will be the signs of your coming in the end of the age? And he said, many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Matthew 24, 11. You know, I was at an ecumenical prayer meeting in Manchester, England a number of years ago. And one of the two speakers was a young lady, uh, a, a Lutheran from Romania, who worked with the Catholic Church to restore unity between the two religions. A bit later, I saw a photo of Pope Francis and Reverend Martin Jung, who is General Secretary of the Lutheran World Federation, hugging each other up in Lund, Sweden. I just wonder what Martin Luther would think of that, considering the fact that the practices of the Catholic Church that caused him to speak out and caused the Catholic Church to seek his death they're still there. You know, there's a problem today that people are accepting these things without testing these things according to the Word of God. A few years ago, 2014, Kenneth Copeland, who's the head of a, a well-known large ministry, led a meeting of hundreds of Pentecostal pastors, and they were joined by Tony Palmer, who's a charismatic bishop from a little-known Anglican communion, and in a video conference with Pope Francis in the Vatican, they declared their unity. After which, he stated, we're all Catholics now. Francis stated that the miracle of unity has begun. Well, you know what? The word is clear. And we covered this last week. I showed you many verses from Revelation chapter 13 that, that foretells a one world church. 
Well, that's unity, but that's not unity that's going to benefit anybody that's partaking of it. You see, so many evangelical leaders, including Chuck Colson, Charles Colson, James Robertson, Joel Osteen, Rick Warren, I mean, there's so many, many, many others. They've joined in to celebrate unity with the Catholic Church. Some have even taken part in a movement called the Chrislam Movement. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, going to a church and there's a Koran sitting next to a Bible. I, I, I wouldn't want to be in there. The basic theology still does not line up. Most mainline denominations have rejected the much that's in the word, throwing out anything that does not line up with the world's culture of the day. And so joining with the Catholic Church for them is not difficult. I mean, they are accepting things that the word says clearly we shouldn't have anything to do with. And yes, I'm talking about abortion. I'm talking about homosexuality. I'm talking about adultery. I'm talking about fornication. That's become commonplace. It's become commonplace in the church. If it's commonplace in the church, then maybe it's not the church. I want to go back to the statement that Francis made to the leaders of the Muslims in Palestine and the Jews in Israel as he invited them to pray together with him and invited them to the, to the uh, Vatican to pray. That was Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the Palestinians, and Shimon Peres, who was the president of Israel. And they came to, they went to Italy and met with Pope in the Vatican to pray together. And Francis said at that time, it is my hope that this meeting will mark the beginning of a new journey where we seek the things that unite so as to overcome the things that divide. What divides the Muslims, Catholics, and Jews. If it is not the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and Jesus Christ Himself that divide them, I don't know what it is. And He's saying we got to. That's what we got. We got to do away with that. And that's what's happening. To have unity with non-believers, you're going to have to give up Jesus Christ. Don't do it. Well, you know, I think I'm going to end here, and we are going to have one more session to close this up. So be back for that next one and uh, pray for us and pray for, listen, pray that your brothers and sisters, people that you know, will not be deceived. Satan has more practice at lying than you have at knowing the truth. But God is faithful and he has sent the spirit of truth into our lives. So stay strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for the things that we see knowing that these are the things that foretell your coming. And we will have to choose to look up for our redemption draweth nigh. That we look for you, but Lord, give us a heart to reach out to the lost, regardless of what kind of robes they wear, what language they speak, what religions they practice. Help us to reach out and pour out the love that you've poured into us to touch their lives, to call them to that saving knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ that they might live forever in glory with you. We praise you and thank you that you loved us when we didn't deserve love. You loved us when we hated you. You loved us when we were never worthy of that love. That's what makes it such a great gift. Help us to share that gift, Father, I pray, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Well, till next time, God bless you and goodbye. Thank you. Of your mighty love.